Hello, my name is Graham Tithley Strong. I'm an orthopaedic surgeon at Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge. I'm going to talk about sternoclavicular joint instability and sports injuries. So I'm quickly just going to go over what stabilizes the sternoclavicular joint. Uh, it, it's got, got very little congruency, so the bony congruency is minimal. Uh, intrinsically, there's the anterior and posterior sternoclavicular joint ligaments and the discs does give some stability and extrinsically they're the, it's mainly the costoclavicular ligaments. The dynamic stabilizers are, are important and this is something that we hadn't appreciated until relatively recently. So the main dynamic stabilizers of the sternoclavicular joint, the sternal part of pec major, sternocleidomastoid itself and to a lesser extent subclavius. So when we're talking about sternoclavicular joint instability, we really took, people previously talked about atraumatic and, and traumatic. Actually, a better understanding of atraumatic instability, it's very similar to the glenohumeral humeral joint. It does look as though um, there are three components. So we can apply the Stanmore triangle for sternoclavicular joint instability. So on the atraumatic side, it's both uh, a structural, so capsular laxity, but probably much more important is muscle patterning, so non-structural. So most of the patients that you see with uh, atraumatic instability or symptomatic atraum or traumatic instability tend to be younger patients, so from the early teens upwards. Most of them have got a mild background type 2, so they've got an element of laxity, which we can see in the uh, non-affected joint. And this has normally been compensated for previously. And then sometimes a precipitating event, such as serving whilst playing tennis or badminton or while swimming, but sometimes not even that the case, they suddenly develop uh, a superimposed type three uh, component, and then they start to have issues with the sternoclavicular joint dislocating, particularly as they abduct and externally rotate. So the treatment rationale really is to try to address the new or the acquired type three patterning problem. And often they can then convert back to you that just having the asymptomatic compensated type two instability. Very occasionally having got rid of the type three patterning, they're unable to compensate for their type two instability and they may, may, may need to get that treated separately, but always do that as a secondary event. So this is a chap with type three patterning. As you can see, his arm's coming back and an arrow is gonna come in. We can see just as he's bringing his arm forward, sternocleid and are desperately trying to, to pull the joint in. But as he comes forward, you can see the sternal part of uh, pec major is actually pulling the medial end of his clavicle out. And it's only when he relaxes that the joint comes in. So rather than the joint dislocating, it's actually being pulled out by sternocladomastoid uh, firing abnormally. So the rationale for treatment is mainly physiotherapy. In the vast majority of patients, we can get better with physiotherapy. Very occasionally, I've used Botox. The rationale really is distract distraction or depowering uh, pec major. And the way we tend to do this is we tend to get the patient to bring their arm back as far as they can. And rather bringing their arm, their arm forward, we get them to rotate into the neutral position whilst they're being resisted at the back. And so they come from this position where they're fully in external rotation and then they rotate forward. So effectively bringing their arm forward. And this is exactly the same chap. And this is on the same day. So he hasn't really had any, uh, any real work yet. And as you can see, he's pulling all the way back. The joint remains in. And then as he brings himself round out of external rotation, you can see that sternocleidomastoid hasn't pulled the joint out. And this is really the rationale for, for, for treatment. And in the vast majority of these chaps, type three patterning uh, can be eradicated and they're left with their type two laxity, which they had previously. Very occasionally, despite getting rid of the type three, the type two laxity uh, is refractory. So this girl had real problems and you can see that despite her, we've got rid of her type three, the joint's still sitting out there. She's never injured herself. She'd actually stretched out on her MR scan. She, her capsule was still there, but it was stretched out and very lax. So in this rare occurrence, you actually need to fix these up. So we did a reconstruction for her and uh, this is her about six months later and she's uh, got a nice stable sternoclavicular joint. So the other group of patients, the traumatic ones, and I think the incidence of traumatic uh, SCJ instability is greatly underestimated. And that's partly because most acute dislocations spontaneously re relocate. Anterior and posterior subluxations are sometimes underappreciated. And there are a number of other injuries, which I'm not going to talk about, their disc tears, sternal fractures, and fractures to the middle end of the clavicle. So one of the reasons that I think these uh, injuries are, are underestimated is that we as physicians have a low index of suspicion, but also the patients have a low index of suspicion. The method of dislocating your uh, 
SC joint is due to an indirect mechanism of injury, and I'll talk about that in a second, where you tend to be hit on the outer aspect of your shoulder. Patients often have global shoulder pain, and actually they think that the medial pain that they're getting has been referred from the glenohumeral joint medially rather than the other way around. And that's both the patients and ourselves. And I think we do inappropriate imaging most of the time. Sternoclavicular joint injuries are soft tissue injuries, so we need to do soft tissue, in, in, soft tissue imaging. Most of the imaging we tend to do is CT scans. So to get an anterior dislocation, it's really an oblique posterior force onto the anterior edge of the shoulder, such as this chap lying in a ruck, and you can see he gets hit, hit on the outer aspect of his shoulder, and it just levers the uh, medial end of the clavicle anteriorly. And for a posterior dislocation, it's really the reverse. Uh, you're hit with an anterior oblique force on the back of the shoulder, and that levers the, the medial end of the clavicle out posteriorly. You can get a posterior dislocation by direct force. It's relatively unusual. It tends to be Soltaris two fracture dislocations occur this way. And I'm not really going to talk about, that, about those today. With regards to imaging, x-rays are very difficult to interpret. There's something called a serendipity view, and it's only really called a serendipity view because you may be quite serendipitous and actually see something. Most of the time, it's very difficult to interpret, and that's because the cervical spine lies behind the sternoclavicular joint. So the go-to investigation that most people use is a CT scan, and they are excellent for dislocated sternoclavicular joints. So this is a posterior dislocation of the, of the left sternoclavicular joint, and this is it reformatted. For myself, I'm very interested, particularly in the acute injuries, what's happened to the vasculature. That's the, the biggest concern. So we always tend to go for an acute dislocation. We always do a CT arteriogram. And when you reformat that, you can see exactly what's happening with regards to the vessels. And it's actually the brachiocephalic vein, which is the biggest concern rather than the arteries. However, most of the patients that we uh, see, uh, they sh even though they've had a dislocation, it's spontaneously relocated. So this is a CT scan of a patient who had a posterior dislocation that was relocated. And in fact, there's nothing that you can really see. It's a little bit like taking a, a CT scan of a dislocated shoulder that's been relocated. You're not really going to see very much. So really what we want to do is to look at the soft tissue. So an MRI scan is probably the most useful investigation. So an MRI scan of the neck or the uh, upper thoracic region actually gives relatively poor resolution for the sternoclavicular joint. And it's not actually aligned in the direction of the joint, which is at 30 degrees to the horizontal plane. And for chronic injuries, it's very difficult to interpret uh, some of the soft tissue injuries. You haven't got uh, an effusion to create an arthrogram uh, environment. So what we tend to do, we use a 3T MRI scan and we actually use a cardiac coil that the thoracic surgeons use, which really helps to enhance the anterior part of the chest wall. We normally try to get the patients prone. Uh, in acute injuries where they've got a hemarthrosis and effusion, that's fine. Uh, but in non-acute injuries, we'll tend to do uh, an arthrogram as well. So we uh, angle our scans at 30 degrees to the axial and coronal planes, which is an alignment to the joint. And we'll also do an arthrogram for a non-acute injury. So this is a uh, MRI scan of a patient who had an acute posterior dislocation that had spontaneously relocated. On their CT scan, everything looked normal, but we can see on the MRI scan, we can see the acute effusion and we can see the rupture of the costoclavicular ligament. So we know that this chap's got a very unstable shoulder. This is a different patient who's had an acute injury. Uh, this is a, an MRI scan and you can see that they've got extravasation of the fluid both anterior and posterior. So we know that they've damaged both the anterior and posterior capsule. This is a patient who had an anterior dislocation that had been relocated, and we can see that they've got rupture of the anterior capsule only, the posterior capsule structures uh, are okay, and they've got some extravasation uh, of the fluid uh, anteriorly, but the, the, uh, capsule, the capsule structures are still present. So with, the manage with regards to the management of traumatic sternoclavicular joint injuries, the type of injuries we're going to come across are anterior and posterior uh, capsular strains or subluxations, anterior or posterior dislocations, mm -hmm. and there are Soltaris II uh, posterior fracture dislocations, which is a subject to, uh, of a different talk. So with regards to strains or subluxations, people like to divide these into type 1, 2 or type 3, type 3 where it's actually uh, torn. In fact, uh, type 1 or type 2, the treatments are treatments the same. Often these patients will have uh, normal um, imaging unless you do an MRI scan. And on MRI scan, you like to see some edema 
or a partial thickness tear of the capsule. The treatment's really the same. Uh, I like to mobilize these people for about um, a, a month with some rest, but they can start to do some passive work and we can aim for them to return to play uh, within about three months. And really it's unlike to have any ongoing issues unless they've got an associated disc tear, which you can pick up on an MRI scan, but that's not to do with instability. That's to obviously to do uh, with clicking and discomfort in the joint. With regards to anterior dislocations, uh, the majority of anterior dislocations will spontaneously relocate. So these are the ones that you may need to get an MRI scan to find out what's going on. However, they're obvious, it's, so, however, if they're obviously dislocated, it's an easy diagnosis to make. And people will prefer to try to do a closed reduction. And we've all seen these closed reductions in, in the textbooks. You want to put longitudinal traction uh, on the affected arm and then pushing downwards, you can then relocate the joint. However, um, having had a, a first time true anterior dislocation of the sternoclavicular joint, there's a 50% recurrence rate and a 75% uh, incidence of recurrent uh, instability, so subluxations without true dislocations. If you do have recurrent instability, um, when you do try to do the surgery, often all of the capsular tissue has disappeared. So the only surgery you can do is a reconstruction using, I prefer to use a hamstring tendon, but using some form of, of, of tendon graft. However, um, as I showed in that uh, picture earlier on, the posterior capsule is stronger than the anterior capsule. So it's possible to dislocate your shoulder anteriorly without tearing the posterior capsule and just, just tearing the anterior capsule. And there are remnants of the capsular tissue present after an acute injury. So perhaps undertaking an augmented repair at the time of injury or after the first dislocation uh, may uh, be something to consider. This is something that we've been um, doing in Cambridge for the past seven or eight years. The first few patients I did were patients who come in and the joint was still out, so I took them to the theatre to reduce them. But then um, with increasing um, confidence success of the surgery, it's something that I will offer to patients who have the first time dislocation that has relocated. It's basically a si simple capsule application uh, where you tighten up the capsule. And the key thing is protecting it. And I protect it with something called an internal brace, which is really two anchors either side of the joint uh, with a, um, a thick uh, fiber tape suture that sits in front of it to protect, protect the repair. So we published a series about three years ago of uh, six patients that we did this uh, procedure on. Uh, they'd all um, injured them, well four of them injured themselves playing sport, one had been in a, in a fight. Uh, we undertook this surgery and with an average follow-up of 28 months, there were no re-dislocations. All of the patients considered their joint stable and more importantly all of them have returned to sport and four out of the six of them undertook contact sports and there have been no complications so that's certainly something that we consider if someone who's had a, a true anterior dislocation. So the management of an anterior dislocation um, if it's a, a, acute uh, and it's still dislocated a, a closed reduction certainly is something that can be done but to consider an open reduction and a capture repair. If it had a spontaneous reduction, certainly the imaging modality of choice I'd recommend would be to do an MRI scan. And if it's acute, you don't need to do an arthrogram. However, there's a quite a high risk of recurrence over 50%. So the options are to either treat them with an acute repair at that time or to treat them expectantly. So posterior dislocations, these are the ones that everyone has great concern. So uh, they're often or they've been traditionally associated with significant retrosternal injuries. And there's been this importance that you must get them reduced within 48 hours. They tend to be high energy injuries uh, and they can have some associated other bony injuries. Uh, often a lot of these guys are uh, uh, motorcycle, horse, uh, sort of equestrian. So they have other associated injuries. And traditionally they've been associated with having a 30% significant intrathoracic injury. I think this is a bit of a fallacy and was actually uh, based on a single case report from 1969. But in the last 50 years, having done an extensive literature review, I've only found one case of a patient who actually had a, a, a life-threatening injury. They actually died, or they actually died at the scene of the injury. They didn't even get back, back to the hospital. So I think um, that whilst uh, there's great concern with regards to these posterior dislocations, I don't think they're quite as critical as, as they might seem. So the management of a acute posterior dislocation, the first thing is, is don't panic. Uh, 
The most important thing or the most important investigation is to get a CT arteriogram. And what we're really looking for, we're not overly concerned about vessel compression. There, there will always be vessel compression because the medial end of the clavicle has moved backward. It's to make sure that there's no internal injury. And we've been um, uh, treating these patients now for the past 15 years with CT arteriograms. And um, so Touchwood so far never found any patients that have actually had an internal, internal injury. So treatment options, you can go for a closed reduction where once again, you have that inline uh, pull and uh, inline traction on the arm. And then you try to pull the clavicle forward um, using a towel clip. Um, that's a pretty difficult thing to do and often isn't successful. And even if you uh, do try to do a, a closed reduction, the outcome isn't great. And there are a couple of papers in the literature. So the paper from Grohl in 2011, uh, where they had a 62% of uh, unsuccessful. So really two thirds of the patients they tried to reduce, uh, they were unable to reduce or they spontaneously relocated. relocated. And Lafosis and Lauren Lafosis is a different Lafos. They did a multi-center study where they found that nearly half of the patients it was unsuccessful to do a, a closed reduction. So certainly my recommendation is to undertake an, uh, an open uh, reduction. Uh, I'm lucky I work, um, uh, Patworth is now on site at Adam Brooks, so I could do this with the thoracic surgeons. Um, we do these patients supine with the sandbag. I tend to always use hamstring, so gracilis gris tendon, uh, autograph with horizontal drill holes and I try to retain the capsule. So this is a, 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 a series of 19 patients that is uh, about to be uh, published um, who all had acute posterior dislocations. As you can see their mean referral time, so it took four days to get to see us and the mean time to surgery was just over a week. So it wasn't something that whilst these patients need to be uh, treated quickly, it's not 48 hours. It's probably 14 day window in which to stabilize these uh, patients without any great issues. They all had a CT arteriogram and they all had vessel compression, but none of them had an inter to internal injury. And we fix them all in the same way using the horizontal figure of eight hamstring tendon reconstruction uh, using most of the time an autograft. There were 17 patients available for follow up, and the mean follow up was 83 months. None of the patients had re-dislocated or had instability and all of their uh, outcome scores were great. And all the patients that wanted to return to contact sports did so at six months with really no restrictions. There's only one patient that didn't and that's because they decided to retire from rugby and there were no complications. So for the management of a posterior dislocation, uh, if it's uh, dislocated, uh, an open reduction and reconstruction certainly would be the go-to procedure that I'd recommend. Uh, it's not super urgent, so there's plenty of time, if you're not happy to do that self, uh, to refer it to a center that will, will do that. I think trying to do a closed reduction um, is it, difficult. It's not always successful. Even if it goes in, it will spontaneously re-dislocate. And it's very difficult to image at the time. You have to get a repeat CT scan. So if you've got a patient who's had a posterior dislocation that's uh, spontaneously reduced, once again, an MRI scan is a go-to investigation. There is a risk of recurrence. However, um, you may want to undergo an acute stabilization or to treat these patients expectantly. If you are going to do a, uh, if you've got a recurrent dislocator, it's really um, the same operation as you do for a, a, an acute patient, apart from the fact you don't have any capsular tissue to re to, to retain. So in conclusion, um, sternocovicular joint instability, atraumatic instability is really made up of type two and type three components. Most patients will have had a background of asymptomatic type two laxity, and they've now got a superimposed type three patterning component that has actually started to cause their joint to dislocate anteriorly. The treatment is really aimed at treating the type three patterning and in most of the patients, they will revert back to the asymptomatic type two instability, and that's all that you need to do. However, occasionally patients will continue to have instability, and that's due to is due to true capsular laxity, and these are the patients that may require surgery. With regards to traumatic dislocations, uh, it tends to be an indirect mechanism of injury. So to have a high index of suspicion when you see these players who complain of global. Uh, shoulder pain and think that the medial pain is related to, 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 the, uh, to, the, to the more lateral injury. 
any concerns at all, my go-to investigation is an MRI scan. I do that ahead of everything apart from acute dislocation, posterior dislocation where we want to do a CT arteriogram. If a patient's had a capture strain or a partial thickness tear, then this is something that can be treated very nicely, non-operatively, probably a, a month of rest and then to start to rehab, but most of them you'd expect to be able to have a full return to function within three months. Um, if they've got an anterior or posterior dislocation that's remained dislocated, um, you can try and attempt to close reduction. However, it's particularly posterior, it's difficult to do. And even when you do it, there's a high chance of, uh, of recurrence. So certainly my recommendation would be a surgical stabilization. If you're an anterior or posterior patient that's uh, relocated their joint, there's a high incidence of, of, of recurrence. However, you may want to consider an acute stabilization, but if not, you maybe you, you can then treat them expectantly. Thank you very much.